Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Phil Lee. I'm a partner in the privacy team here at Field Fisher, and we are delighted to welcome you today to this webinar on data protection issues in artificial intelligence. Now, I suppose the moral of today's story is um, is to be careful what you say to Alexa. And you know, I don't know if any of you are like me, but uh, but at home, I am I am one of those people who tends to say please and thank you to Alexa whenever I ask it to do anything for me, uh, much to the amusement of my wife and children. But I have that sort of niggling doubt at the back of my mind about what will happen if the robots take, a, take over the world and will they remember that I was polite to them and, and therefore spare me. Now, um, today's webinar is part of a series of webinars that the Field Fisher team is running uh, in conjunction with our Silicon Valley office and further details about the other webinars that we are doing will be provided at the end of this presentation. In today's webinar, we're going to cover three core areas. We're going to look at what actually is artificial intelligence and how does it work. We're going to look at some of the core data protection issues that arise in the context of artificial intelligence. And then we're going to look at some of the practical challenges that arise when dealing with data protection uh, in AI. Now, to assist me on today's webinar, I am uh, I, delighted to um, to say that I'm supported by my colleagues, my partner, Leonie Power, and uh, uh, Robert Fett, who is a senior associate in our team, both of whom are out and out data protection experts. And so we're, we're very lucky to have them with us today. And you may be aware, if you've been following sort of news in the artificial intelligence space, uh, that there was some breaking developments over the past week. Uh, there was a leaked draft of a regulation uh, to, uh, to regulate AI in the EU. And the official version of that was just published yesterday. Now, I have to say, uh, because this is all a new development and it's, it encompasses issues that are wider than just pure data protection, that's not going to be within the scope of our um, presentation today. But for those of you that are interested, you may just like to know that the new regulation is basically looking at sort of three core types of AI. Those are types of AI that it considers to be, um, it, that ought to be prohibited, AI that is what they consider to be high risk systems and that will be subject to uh, a lot of requirements around transparency and documentation and quality of data used to train the AI systems. And then sort of all other, all other types of AI systems, which again will have transparency requirements attaching to them. And alongside that, you can see that some of the thinking around this new regulation has clearly had one eye on the, the GDPR. Um, there's going to be a creation of a new European AI board, very similar to the European Data Protection Board that we have under the GDPR. And there will be significant penalties, up to 4% of annual worldwide turnover, for breaches of the new AI regulation. Again, very similar to, to what we see under the GDPR. But it's, it's only just been proposed. It has the whole legislative process to work through. So it may be another few years before we see this law actually coming into effect. So for today, we're going to focus on data protection issues. So to kick it all off, um, if you're anything like me, you have probably been uh, you know, attending calls, joining webinars, um, speaking with vendors or technology providers, and they'll be talking to you about AI. And you may sort of at the back of your mind have this notion of what AI is, it's something to do with making computers behave like humans, but not really understanding sort of quite how it works. And then you'll hear people throw other terms at you like sort of machine learning and it all starts to get quite confusing. So the purpose of what we want to do at covering this first part is to look at what actually is AI and how does it work. Now, just to put this in context, if you don't already realize it, the odds are that you're using AI on a daily basis already. Um, up on the screen here are just three examples of, of sort of common uses of AI. So on the left here, we have Google search. You can see here, um, I've typed in what is artificial intelligence and AI has, uh, sorry, Google has used its artificial intelligence to work out that probably what I was trying to type is what is artificial intelligence. And below that, it's also suggested a number of other types of um, links that I might be interested in seeing to learn more about artificial intelligence. So again, how does it know how, how to do that? Well, of course, it's seeing all the searches that people have, put, uh, have, have entered into Google beforehand. It's learning from that and the types of things that people are interested in. And it's using that to propose better search results. 
In the middle of the screen, you can see a screenshot from my iPhone. Uh, if, if those of you who have iPhones and Google does something similar, um, it, you know, if you go into the albums on your phone, it will it will group lots of photos by face, and you can see here the the groupings of uh, the photos of me um, back from the days when when I didn't have uh, have any facial hair uh, up to you know the present day. And it has somehow detected my face in all of these images and it's compiled them together on my phone so that I can go back and see all the photos about me and similarly or do things for my wife and my kids and so on. Again, how does it know how to do that? It's using AI, it's using face detection, some very clever stuff going on in the background. And then on the right hand side here, you can see a picture of a Tesla car. Increasingly, you are finding that AI is being built into uh, into sort of you know into vehicles to assist in, from sort of very basic uses to making sure, for example, that cars stay in light in lane when they're driving on the road, through to some of the more sophisticated things that you're seeing the likes of Tesla trying to do, where they are building autonomous vehicles that will ultimately drive themselves, all with the goal ultimately of making the roads safer and, uh, and easing congestion and so on. But of course, those are all the very positive uses of AI. On the flip side of it, science fiction has taught us to be also quite wary of AI as well. And this is where I go back to my point about being polite to Alexa. That's just my tip for today. Uh, you know, on, on the left here, you can see an example of HAL 9000, which was the a slightly ominous AI system in 2001, A Space Odyssey. Um, those of you may remember him refusing to uh, open the bay doors uh, to, to, to let one of the astronauts back into the spaceship, um, the slightly murderous use of AI. Uh, and over on the right hand side, we have a, a poster for Terminator. Again, I think lots of people, when they think about the kind of the worst possible scenarios with their AI, they imagine sort of Terminator machines roaming the planet and, and taking over humanity. So, you know, the uh, you know, these kinds of fears have kind of pervaded people for a long time, and it's why we have data protection rules, and it's why we have the AI looking, uh, sorry, we have the EU looking at creating new AI regulation to ensure that the AI systems that we develop serve humanity and that they are developed in ethical ways that are respectful for, uh, for people's information and basically operate in the, in the ways that we want them to and not in the ways that we don't. So that's all well and good. We've all got a, a sense of kind of you know, AI in everyday life, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we actually really know what AI is. So what is AI? Well, we've put a definition on the screen here. This comes from the International Working Group on Data Protection in Telecommunications. And what they say is that AI is the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks normally requiring human intelligence. And then they give examples of visual perception, of speech recognition, of decision making and translation between languages. In other words, it's trying to get um, computers to mimic human intelligence, to learn and to use mimic human intelligence. And if you go back um, sort of 20, 30 years, you know, some of the early examples you may have seen of this, uh, if you were a bit of a computer nerd like me and ever used to sort of play chess uh, on your computer, you may have found that the computer was very hard to beat. Now, in the very early days of those kind of programs where they created um, chess algorithms, actually literally what used to happen was that programmers would sit down with chess experts and they would try to create rules for the computer about how to play chess. And so they would teach it, you know, if you're, if, if you're at this particular point in the game, you know, this might be a good next move to make. Now, what that meant was you had to manually code tens, hundreds, thousands of rules to teach a computer to play chess effectively. And the, the computer wasn't really learning. We were just giving it a set of rules to follow. Now, what artificial intelligence, uh, you know, that was one example of artificial intelligence. You know, outwardly, it looked like the computer was doing something intelligent. The reality was that it probably wasn't. It was just following the rules that had been hard coded into it. Nowadays, when you when people talk about artificial intelligence, they tend to use the term synonymously with the concept of machine learning. And that's where these things can get a little bit confusing because you may have heard of machine learning and things like deep learning and neural networks and wondered what on earth are these things? Well, the way to think of it is like a series of those kind of Russian matryoshka dolls where you know each is kind of a subset of the other. So AI refers to the overall objective 
of trying to get computer systems to behave in ways that mimic human intelligence. Machine learning, deep learning, neural networks are all technologies used to achieve that overall objective. Machine learning is basically the process of getting machines to learn from data sets to produce particular outputs, particular predictions, and to basically teach themselves how to improve. Deep learning is a kind of subset of machine learning. It's a kind of more advanced form of machine learning, and it works on what are called neural networks. Neural networks are essentially um, basically uh, sort of systems that are designed to mimic the human brain. It, 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 at the simplest level, what you do is you create software or hardware neurons that interconnect together. And they it, very much like the neurons of the brain, and they receive inputs and they fire those, they, they fire um, uh, outputs from neuron to neuron and back when they feed it round and, and so on. And the overall result is that, that that huge layering of neurons together creates something akin to a human brain, which can be used to, to, um, uh, to do very sophisticated machine learning. And that very sophisticated machine learning is, is typically what we refer to as deep learning. So deep learning occurs on neural networks. Machine learning is not quite as sophisticated, and we'll explain an example of how machine learning works in a moment. Now you may be wondering why is AI significant? Well, we've already seen um, we've already seen you know, sort of examples of AI in use, but you may be thinking, well, you know, if AI is just about mimicking human intelligence, then why do we need machines to do that? Why don't we just use humans to do it? I think the short answer to that is that that AI can do it quicker and better than humans can. They're capable of, of, of doing things that humans can't achieve. And there's a great example here that um, from, from Google's uh, DeepMind AI system, AlphaGo Zero. And what they did, they used a, a, a machine learning technology on it called reinforcement learning. And literally within a few hours, um, and with admittedly with all the computing resources that Google has to throw at a system like this, it was able to teach itself chess uh, with, you know, it, within the space of a day to a point where it was essentially, it could be every other um, system on the planet. Now, what was kind of interesting about it was that the, the other sort of chess champion systems that existed had actually been used um, basically using other forms of machine learning technology. AlphaGo Zero had essentially taught itself. It was given some basic, very basic rules, but ultimately taught itself how to play chess. And in a matter of a few hours became indefeatable. Um, so, you know, and again, if you think how long it takes a, a human chess master to learn chess, you know, it's a process of years. Anybody who's watched Queen's Gambit on Netflix will see just how much, um, you know, effort and skill goes into it. And computers are achieving that at a pace that we just can't achieve. So let's look at how machine learning works. Now, what I'm going to talk to here is not an example of uh, of um, deep learning. This is ordinary machine learning. Uh, it, it's what we refer to as supervised machine learning, which is in practice probably one of the most common forms of machine learning that you see. Now, the important thing to understand is that computers are not inherently clever. If you were to give a computer an image of a cat and a dog, it wouldn't be able to tell you the difference between the two. You have to train it to do that. And so what you do is you provide your AI system with what we call training data. And you know, what we do is we get a load of images of cats and a load of images of dogs, and we basically label them. We say, this is a dog and this is a cat. And what to help the AI system out, what we do is we define features of what it is that, that will distinguish as a cat from a dog. Now with humans, we can look at a cat and a dog and we can, um, we, we can just kind of instinctively recognize that one is a cat and one is a dog. But computers, you have to tell them what the differences are so they can learn. So what we'd say here is we say, we say that dogs are larger, they're, 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 they have dull claws and they're a bit scruffy. And cats, by contrast, they're smaller, they have sharp claws and they tend to be quite tidy. And then you feed all those hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, millions of images into the AI algorithms. And you, and you say to it, this is an example of a cat and, what it, oh, and this is an example of a dog. And what it starts to do is it matches those images against the features that you've described, and it starts to attach weights to each of those figures, uh, each of those features, and it works out which are more important, which of those features are more important from, for distinguishing a dog from a cat. So then once it's gone through a process of learning, you then present it with another image, and here's a, an image of a fairly scruffy cat. 
and you give it to the to the uh, machine learning algorithm and it looks at it and it says well this thing is fairly scruffy you've told me that that dogs are scruffy therefore it's a dog and actually this is very clearly a cat so you, you the you know uh, uh, an engineer may provide some feedback to the ai algorithm saying no actually this is not a dog it's a cat and what the what the uh, ai system will do is then to adjust the weight that it attaches to scruffiness in identifying a dog and it'll say well okay you know i'd sort of assume being scruffy was really important but maybe it's not that important maybe being larger or having dull claws is more important to identifying a cat or a dog and you do that enough times and give it enough features and it attaches it, it learns how to attach the weights to each of those features and then eventually it becomes pretty good at recognizing and next time you give it some a picture here of a leopard and despite the fact it's a, a leopard is a large cat um, it, st it still recognizes that despite being large it is a cat so ultimately over time it starts to learn so what can you take from that well you can learn from that that computers are not inherently clever they don't just know these things they have to be trained that's why we have training sets that's why we have engineers that's why we teach them about the features some of the more advanced um, AI models that you see, the deep learning neural nets, um, they will start to teach themselves. They will identify features themselves without humans having to, to, uh, to, to train them on that. They can just give them a whole bunch of data and those deep learning systems will start to separate out data and work out what the features are. But computers, a basic computer is not inherently clever. And you have to be very careful because if you give it biased data, you will get biased models. You know, there have been examples, for example, of technology companies who have been trying to use AI systems to identify candidates who are likely to be better engineers. And they do that by giving the giving AI systems, you know, details about the existing engineers they have. Problem with that is that, you know, if you are a technology company where the majority of your engineers tend to be male, what you may just be teaching your AI system is that men are better at being engineers, which of course is very biased and, and incorrect. And so what may happen is you end up with a situation where AI systems start to reject female candidates. That's not what you want. So you have to be very careful with the data that you use to train uh, AI systems. And when AI, AI goes wrong, it, it can go very, very wrong. Um, I've got a, a, an image here on the right-hand side of that 1980s film, War Games, where you may remember a teenage hacker almost accidentally starts off uh, a, a nuclear war based on some, some AI responses uh, with military systems. But, um, you know, an example of that may be, uh, you hear stories about some of the self-driving cars, for example, um, a tragic case in the US with Tesla, where uh, one of their vehicles did not recognize that uh, it was passing uh, It was passing a lorry. Uh, I think the story about it was that it mistook the side of the lorry for open sky, and in trying to overtake another car, actually drove into the lorry. So, you know, you know, AI systems aren't perfect. They do make mistakes. They will get better with time. That's what they do. But when it goes wrong, it can have some very serious consequences. And so with, um, you know, with these things, this is why we need to create regulation to make sure that they're developed in safe, ethical and privacy respectful ways. And it does, of course, raise that overarching question of what happens when a human no longer understands the algorithm. Ultimately, what all AI systems do is they create mathematical models that predict outcomes. Now, they're very sophisticated algorithms that a human, hum, a human knows how to create the AI system, but ultimately it doesn't understand really how the AI does what it does once it's created that model. And that raises some interesting questions, but those are probably ethical questions beyond the scope of today's presentation. So with that, I am now going to hand you over. Oh no, sorry, I've got two more points. Um, just very briefly, how does facial recognition technologies use AI? Uh, Quick example here, you know, very much what we were talking about before. Um, you take, if you load a, a, an image of a face into an AI system, it will then start to extract the features of that face. So what we were talking about earlier, what are the distinguishing features of that face? And it will use it so that in future, when you present it with um, a, a photograph of the same individual, it can compare the features of that, that individual's face against the features it already knows and work out who that individual is. So if you go back to that, iOS album of me earlier. That was how my phone did that. And how do virtual voice assistants use AI? Well, you know, in, in very simple terms, a, a virtual voice assistant is actually little more than a glorified search engine. What happens is that when you speak to your Siri or your Alexa, that uses um, natural language processing, a, a form of AI that converts the spoken voice into a transcript. 
that transcript is then passed by computer systems to, to work out the semantics of what was said and it works out what was the instruction you just gave it, you know, what's on my local cinema or what's the traffic like on the way to work. And then it can it will conduct a, a, a sort of search engine search to find the results for that before ultimately returning those results to you. And that is essentially how those work. So with that, I've probably taken up more time than I should telling you how AI works. I'm going to pass over now to Leonie, who's going to talk to you about some of the core privacy risks. Leonie, over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Phil. If you wouldn't mind just moving to the first slide um, on that, Phil, please. Um, OK, so the first question is, well, why are data protection laws relevant to AI in the first place? And at its very basic, AI involves data processing just very large amounts of data, some of which will be personal data. So it's essentially like any other form of data processing. It's really just about some computers crunching some algorithms and some data. But what makes AI unique is the sophistication of those algorithms and the volumes of the data that's typically involved. And ultimately, as Phil says, Humans just don't understand how machine learning trained, uh, trained algorithms work, but we just know that they do. Um, if you could move to the next slide, please, Phil. Um, just one, one previous one, I think we've gone too far ahead there. Yeah. Um, so looking then at the legal and regulatory landscape for AI, um, obviously to the extent that personal data is processed, then the GDPR will be relevant as well as local data protection laws. Um, the privacy directive will also be relevant to the extent that the AI implementation involves the accessing of or storing of information on a device, and that's whether that information is personal or not. Um, then we've got the European Convention of Human Rights, because we've got to remember that data protection aims to protect individual rights and freedoms with regard to the processing of their personal data. Now, of course, that includes the right to privacy, but it also includes other rights beyond privacy, such as the right to non-discrimination. So any data protection by design and by default means that you must take into account the risk to rights and freedoms of data subjects generally and not just in a privacy context. And so that's why um, you know, discrimination, anti-discrimination laws will also be relevant. Phil mentioned earlier the draft EU regulation on AI that will apply, as he said, to all AI systems, but with a particular focus on prohibited systems and high risk, high risk systems. So again, it's broader than just data protection. Then we've got the NIST directive requirements, and they're likely in many cases to cover AI cloud computing services. So even if an adverse atta attack in an AI context does not necessarily involve personal data, it may still be a NIST incident. And then finally, we've got potentially sector and technology specific local laws, and they are likely to depend on the AI technologies being used in the context of the processing. So an example might be licensing laws for the licensing of some types of AI technologies, such as facial recognition technologies. Next slide, please, Phil. Okay, so let's look more specifically then on how GDPR applies to AI. Now, the key point to understand here is that the underlying data protection questions for even the most complex AI project are much the same as with any new project. So the questions are, is the data being used fairly and lawfully and transparently? Do people understand how their data is being used? How is it being kept secure? So all the full gamut of data protection issues will be relevant, but there are ones that cause particular challenges in an AI context, and I've outlined those on the slide. And if we look at accountability, from an accountability perspective, organizations are required to account for the risks arising from the processing of the personal data. Now, AI implementation, implementations generally involve a higher degree of risk to rights and freedoms than in the context of other um, processing of personal data. And in the vast majority of cases, the use of AI will involve a type of processing that's likely to result in a high risk to individuals' rights and freedoms, and therefore trigger a legal obligation to undertake a data protection impact assessment. In terms of fairness, lawfulness, 
and transparency, one of the key issues that you have to consider is what is your lawful basis for the relevant data processing? And it's likely to be the case that you would have different lawful basis for your AI development versus your um, AI deployment phases. And there will be challenges in relying on certain lawful basis in an AI context. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. From a fairness perspective, it's about understanding what the reasonable expectations of individuals will be in an AI context, but it's also about ensuring things like statistical accuracy, because that, that will impact specifically on fairness. Um, and also the likelihood of bias within an AI system will impact on fairness. And in looking at fairness, um, organizations might also want to consider having opt-out choices and some of the ethical AI considerations that um, Phil alluded to. From a purpose limitation perspective, you know, that particular GDPR principle, again, poses key challenges because that principle stipulates that personal data must be collected for specified, explicit and legitimate purposes and not further processed in a manner that's incompatible with those purposes. So data that's collected for a particular purpose can not simply be redeployed to train your AI models without seeking consent from the relevant individuals. From a security perspective, again, you'll have all of the known security risks, but AI makes known risks worse and more challenging to control. And this is because of additional complexity, as well as things like heavy reliance on third party coding relationships, the need to integrate with third party components. And there's also new types of risks, such as adversarial attacks on machine learning models. And I'll touch on that um, briefly in a few minutes. Personnel involved in AI may also be from a wide range of backgrounds and may not necessarily appreciate the broader security compliance requirements and data protection more generally. And in many cases, you're going to be training large data sets, uh, which will involve training data being copied and imported from their original location. And, and, and so it's essential you know, that you consider the risks in that particular context. AI often uses open source code. So in many cases, implementing AI will require changes to an organization's software stack, and that will introduce additional security risks. The ICO's code on AI emphasizes very specifically the need to keep up to date with state of the art security measures in an AI context. Then from a data minimization perspective, there is an inherent conflict between the need for data minimization on the one hand, and the need to allow machine learning to conclude what information is necessary from large data sets. But again, the ICO guidance on AI makes clear that there are techniques that can ensure organizations only process what they need to process. And it recommends that those organizations can consider very specifically those technical measures. From an individual rights perspective, um, in many cases, personal data that's fed into uh, an AI system, so in other words, that becomes training data, will be subject to pre-processing. So to change it from one form to another to make it into training data. Now that will still be personal data because it's still likely to be um, possible to use that data to single out an individual, for example, through a series of their unique purchases. But because it's been subject to pre-processing, it will be harder to link um, that data to the individual. So in many cases, the identifiers will have been removed, the contact details will have been removed. So it's much more challenging to deal with individual rights. And one particular right poses specific challenges in an AI context, and that's the Article 22 right in the GDPR, um, not to be subject to um, decision-making based solely on automated processing that has a legal or similarly significant effect. And we'll look briefly at that in more detail um, in a subsequent slide. Next slide, please, Phil. Okay, so very briefly then in terms of accountability and carrying out your data protection impact assessment. One of the key challenges that arises in, the, in this context will be around the description of the processing. Um, because it's likely to be highly complex and technical. And what the ICO guidance suggests in this context is that you consider having two different versions of your DPIA, one that's for a specialist audience and one that contains a more high level description of the processing that's useful for explaining the processing to individuals and to internal stakeholders. 
It's also necessary as part of the DPIA to demonstrate necessity and proportionality. In other words, there's no less intrusive way of achieving that the objective that you're seeking to achieve. It's important also as part of your DPIA to explain any relevant variation or margins of error. And it's important to document trade-offs. So there will be a number of trade-offs arising in an AI context. And an example of a trade-off is uh, data minimization on the one hand versus the need to ensure statistical accuracy on the other hand. Or another example is ensuring AI explainability on the one hand versus increasing the risk of privacy attacks on the other, the more that you make the model transparent to potential attackers. So you need to document those trade-offs and the rationale for the trade-offs within your DPIAs. Um, so you identify them, you, um, uh, you assess any existing or potential trade-offs when you design or indeed when you procure the AI system and you consider available technical approaches to minimize the need for trade-offs and also have clear lines of accountability for final trade-off decisions and review them on a regular basis. The final point to note in this context is that the DPIA, like all DPAs, should be a living document, but particularly in an AI context, the DPIA needs to address this idea of concept drift. In other words, if the demographics of the target population um, shift or if people change their behavior, then you need to consider whether the DPIA also needs to be revisited. So there are some specific issues that arise from a, a DPIA perspective. Um, next slide, please, Phil. I'm not going to go into too much detail on this particular slide because this is um, my colleagues in Silicon Valley are running a separate series on AI and they go into this in quite some detail. Suffice to say that one of the key principles in the GDPR is that processing must be fair and lawful and um, controllers must ensure transparency of data processing. From a lawfulness perspective in an AI context, like with any other data processing, you have to consider the legal basis for that processing. And you must break down and separate each processing purpose and identify an appropriate legal basis for each one. And as I've mentioned, it's likely to be the case that you would have different lawful basis in the, in the development versus the deployment phase. Now, I've outlined on this slide um, the three most likely legal basis on which organizations um, could rely in an AI context. Um, consent is likely to be an appropriate legal basis in a number of contexts, um, and indeed consent will be required in certain cases. For example, if you're processing biometric data in order to uniquely identify an individual, that's uh, special category data and therefore triggers the need to comply with a special category condition in Article 9. The most likely condition that's appropriate is, is consent. But there are some challenges in relying on consent because from a GDPR perspective, there must be a genuine choice. And the more things that an organization wants to do from an AI perspective, the more difficult it is to ensure that consent is specific and informed. And if relying on consent during deployment, organizations must be ready to accommodate withdrawal of that consent. In terms of reliance and contractual necessity, any processing that relies on this basis must be objectively necessary to deliver the service. So while, for example, in a, in a virtual voice assistant context, you might be able to rely on that basis in order to execute a voice command, it's unlikely that you will be able to rely on it for service improvement. And whether or not you can rely on, person, on this basis in order to personalize content depends very much on, on the circumstances. In terms of reliance on legitimate interests, it's key to note that you cannot rely on this basis of processing if the use of the data would be unexpected or cause unnecessary harm. And obviously the risk of that happening is far higher in an AI contact, context than in other processing contexts. Um, I just included on that slide also a link to um, the ICO's guidance that it produced in conjunction with the Alan Turing Institute. Um, the key issues arising in relation to transparency in an AI context are addressed in that particular guidance. And of course, the challenge will be to um, explain in a concise and easy to understand manner um, what's happening in the context of the particular data processing operations. Um, you'll see on this slide also that um, I've included a box that suggests that consent 
may be needed in other contexts if there are specific rules triggered, like um, Article 9, we've mentioned special category data, but we'll come in a minute to talk about automated decision making, and it's likely you would require um, explicit consent to the extent that that automated decision making involves um, a legal or similarly significant effect for the individual. Also, to the extent that you're accessing information on a device, um, that triggers the cookie rules of Article 5.3 of the Privacy Directive, and therefore consent will be required. Um, but as I say, my Silicon Valley colleagues go into this in um, quite a bit more detail. Next slide, please, Phil. Okay. So just we've mentioned some of the challenges that arise in a security con context um, from an AI perspective. And I mentioned that many of the risks are the risks that we already know about, but that they're exacerbated in an AI context. But AI also introduces potentially new security risks. One of those risks is known as model inversion attack. Um, and what that basically is, 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 is a description of the scenario in which an attacker has access to some personal data belonging to specific individuals that are included in the training data for a particular model. And because they have access to that data and they have access to the model, they can infer further personal data about those same individuals by observing the inputs and outputs of the model. And if we take an example of facial recognition systems, they are often designed to allow third parties to query the model. So when the model is given the image of a person whose face it recognizes, it basically returns its best guess as to the name of that person and an associated confidence rate. And what, can, what attackers can potentially do is they can probe the model by submitting many differently randomly generated facial images and by observing the outputs, so the names and the confidence scores, they could potentially reconstruct the face images associated with those individuals that have been included in the training data. And so you can see on the left one of those reconstructed versions. And while it's imperfect, researchers have found that they can be matched by human reviewers to the individuals in the training data with 95% accuracy. And that's an example that's taken from the ICO's guidance on AI and I've included a link also to that guidance in the slide. Next slide, please, Bill. Um, this slide just illustrates another potential new security risk known as a membership inference attack. And essentially what it does is it allows a malicious actor to deduce if a given individual is present in the training data on an AI model. So basically, attackers have the target model and they use the target model in conjunction with information they already have about the individual to work out if that individual was part of the training data. Now, they can't necessarily find out additional information about the individual, but they can find out whether they were in the original training set. And that's not necessarily always particularly significant. But if, for example, the model is trained using vulnerable or sensitive data, so from a vulnerable or sensitive population, like those with dementia or those with HIV, for example, then revealing that someone is part of that population can, can give rise to significant privacy risks. Next slide, please, Phil. Um, so finally, then, um, just to look briefly in more detail at Article 22.1 of the GDPR. So I mentioned specifically some of the challenge that arises in relation to respecting individual rights. One particular individual right that poses significant risks in an AI context is um, Article 22.1. And what that article says is that individuals have the right not to be subject to decision making that is based solely on automated pro processing, including profiling, which has legal or similarly significant effects on that individual. Now, in many AI implementations, that is exactly what the AI system is designed to do. It's designed to you know, produce certain predictions, and based on those predictions, certain decisions will be taken. Um, so. Um, if, if Article 22 is triggered, in other words, if there is automated decision making going on that potentially has these legal or similarly significant effects, what Article 22 says is that there are only certain legal bases on which that processing can be carried out. Either you need the explicit consent of the relevant individual or the processing must be necessary for the performance of a contract or the taking steps to enter into the contract, or the processing must be authorized, by, or you know, must be authorized by union or member state law, which um, introduces some suitable measures to safeguard the individual's rights and freedoms. 
Now, even if you have the appropriate legal basis, even if, for example, you have the explicit consent of the individual to undertake this type of decision making, certain safeguards still need to be built into the system by virtue of Article 22. Um, and those safeguards demand that you uh, basically have some process whereby um, the individual can obtain human intervention um, can express his or her point of view and or contest the relevant decision that's taken. And so it's important, and again, the ICO guidance makes this absolutely clear, that to the extent that you are obliged to insert a human into the process, that that's a, you know, a, a human with genuine decision-making power. It's not a token human intervention and that they do have the power to overturn the decision. And one of the key things also is that you you know, you make sure that you mitigate risks like automation bias. And automation bias basically is that at the end of, you know, the algorithmic process, um, humans tend to trust that process and that the output of that process is correct. But as, as Phil has pointed out, AI can, can, can get things wrong. So it's important to ensure appropriate processes and procedures are in place to avoid that automation bias to the extent that you do in, allow humans um, or that you do insert humans into the process. Um, so that um, brings me to the end of the risk section and I'll now hand over to Rob who will talk a little bit about some of the practical issues. Thank you. Thanks, Leonie. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. So the first practical problem we're going to address is that of um, negotiating data protection agreements um, between vendors and their customers where the vendor is providing an AI service. So as you may have noticed already in uh, non-AI processing, there can be some complexities about whether a vendor is a controller or a processor or potentially a bit of both. And this conundrum is certainly no easier when AI is involved, um, but we'll come on to discuss that uh, in a bit more detail on the next slide. So the bottom line is if a vendor is processing data for AI purposes, uh, and that's only to benefit uh, a specific customer contributing the data, um, then there's a stronger argument that that vendor will be a processor. But if the vendor is processing data to benefit itself or um, other customers as well, uh, for example, for, for general product improvement purposes, then um, or, or if it's targeting users, then that vendor is much more likely to be a controller. So um, how do we deal with this in a sort of data protection negotiation? Well, we've seen, um, let's look at it from a sort of a product improvement um, perspective, because that's a very common um, some point of negotiation. Well, we've seen a few different strategies about how to deal with this in practice. So the first one is um, you know, basically to, just to disclose the fact that the vendor is a controller and that the data will be processed for product improvement. Um, obviously, that's sort of more legally accurate um, description, but it could well meet with some contractual resistance from a customer. Um, often customers kind of get into the mindset of, you know, all the vendors are processors, and they don't tend to kind of want anything um, kind of outside that box. Um, so if we're going down this route, maybe we could um, make it a bit more uh, tolerable to the vendor, if, um, sorry, to the customer, if we um, kind of give them an opt-in or potentially an opt-out um, to allow them some sort of control about, you know, whether their data will be um, used for product improvement. Um, kind of more generally. So, so that's the first approach. Um, the second approach, and perhaps the more traditional alternative, is for the vendor to position itself as a processor. Unfortunately, though, this is a bit like um, fitting a square peg into a round hole, um, because the vendor is going to need to get instructions from the customer to process that data for product improvement purposes in order to meet requirements um, under Article 28 of the GDPR. Um, and that's where, again, you, you're likely to get that kind of resistance from the customers and potentially hold up a deal. So what's the answer? Well, um, a third option could be anonymization. Um, now, that's going to require um, a bit of investment, potentially some, some technical wizardry. And if the vendor, though, is able to fully anonymize the data, 
then that data will no longer be personal data. So it would come outside of the, um, the GDPR and therefore outside the data protection agreements that you're negotiating. Um, but sometimes trying to meet the true definition of anonymization under the GDPR can be quite challenging. And it may be the case that actually what the vendor is doing is only pseudonymizing the data, which would still make it um, sort of within the GDPR and within that DPA. Um, the ICO um, in the UK has committed to producing some more guidance on this topic. So hopefully we'll get that later this year. Um, and it's probably also worth pointing out that you don't have to 100% guarantee that it will be 100% fully anonymized to you know, absolutely everybody in the universe. Um, the standard under the GDPR is that you, you only need to take account of means reasonably likely to be used um, to kind of identify the data. Um, now, obviously, that's going to depend on a lot of factors. Um, for example, you know, the technology available to actually kind of you know, match data and work out whose it is. Um, and, and that's going to be not just at the time of the processing, but you also need to take into account, you know, how that technology might develop in the future. Um, but this is obviously something to, to think about, um, depending on what kind of data you have and how easy it is to anonymize. Um, finally, the fourth option, well, I, I call it an option. Um, it, it's not really, really legally compliant, so quite risky. Um, and, and this is the one of basically, you know, doing your, um, your product improvement using the data and, and kind of not disclosing it to your customers. Um, you know, that's going to raise quite a lot of um, risk in terms of potential investigations um, from regulators. Um, and it's also going to ultimately lead to a breach of contract um, with your customers. Um, because if you're not following their instructions and you're kind of going beyond those instructions, um, unfortunately, this is kind of the position where a lot of vendors find themselves in at the moment, um, for, you know, particularly from customers who, who want a kind of more traditional processor role. Um, so, you know, potentially forced into that position, but it, it's certainly not ideal. And, you know, these three other options are something to consider. Um, next slide, please. So we're now going to talk about in a little bit more detail the roles of um, controllers and processors in artificial intelligence, and you know how we determine um, you know who is who. Well, hopefully, um, or helpfully rather, the ICO has published some guidance on this topic, and they will also be consulting uh, later this year on their cloud computing guidance, uh, which also has some relevant. Um, bits about artificial intelligence. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, it's a good opportunity to um, kind of give the ICO some background on, on kind of how you see uh, the, the technical and the commercial challenges of using AI in the cloud and, and potentially influence um, the development of that guidance. So what hints does the ICO already give about distinguishing between the controller and the processor role when using AI? Well. Controller activities um, are going to be where the vendor makes um, overarching decisions about how the data is processed. So that will include things like you know, the decision to collect data in the first place, what types of personal data are collected, the purposes it's used for, uh, what, which individuals you're collecting data about, how long to retain the data, and, and how to respond to requests in line with people's data subject rights. Meanwhile, the ICO says that you're more likely to be a processor if um, you don't uh, have any purpose of your own for processing that data and you only act on the customer's instructions. Now, that doesn't actually stop you from making some decisions as a processor, but these are going to be more technical decisions. So, for example, it could be around um, you know, the IT systems and the particular technical methods you're using to process the personal data. Um, how that data is going to be physically stored, um, the security measures that you'll use to protect it, and how you're going to retrieve, transfer, delete, and, and, and dispose of that data um, within you know, your, uh, your systems. Um, now, for um, SAS vendors in particular, these kind of um, controller type activities can, can raise some challenges. Um, and obviously, we've talked about um, product improvement, um, but you know, potentially other factors as well. You know, as a, as a vendor, you're trying to 
put together a product which is often quite standard across your customer base. And um, so it, it can be the case that to some extent you, you already are making as a vendor some decisions about how the product operates that affects all your customers. Um, so if you don't want to be a controller and you're, you're trying to get yourself into that processor bucket, um, you know, what can you do to, to do that? So one route actually is for the vendor to provide a bit more optionality for the customers. So this could be things like um, settings, which the customer can turn on and off, um, options for, for how long data is stored, or permitting adjustments to the accuracy of the algorithm. So if we take um, this sort of AI recruitment software as an example, um, you know, that, that's, as Lenny sort of discussed, that's kind of you know, AI being used to rank candidates um, for a job based on their CVs. Well, um, you know, how can we make that more of a kind of processor-like um, in the processing that it's doing? Well, if we give the customer some control over you know, potentially how to match um, specific criteria that you're looking for as a, in a job um, with individuals, um, you know, which, which criteria you're going to emphasize more. Or um, as another example, in the kind of facial recognition context, you know, it could be about um, you know, adjusting the accuracy of the model. So are you going to be only putting forward um, matches where there's a 99% chance of um, you know, the face and, and the, the person matching, or are you going to um, you know, accept only 80% or, or 90%? So if we give um, the customers these kind of decisions, um, then it's going to be more justifiable to say that you are a processor rather than a controller. And in fact, it's the customer who is the controller. Uh, next slide, please. So finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, virtual voice assistants. And obviously, there's, there's a ton of issues we could discuss, but I'm going to pick out um, just three of them. So firstly, consent. Um, as we know, um, a key feature of voice assistants is that they're going to store data on the device, and they're going to transmit that data to a server uh, where the majority of the processing is going to take place. So because of that storage and that transmission, that means that the e-privacy directive is going to come into play uh, along with the GDPR. As you probably know, consent is the default requirement under the e-privacy directive when storing or accessing data on terminal equipment, such as a voice assistant. Um, there are, of course, ex uh, exceptions to this. So firstly, consent is not going to be required when you're carrying out or facilitating the transmission of a communication. And secondly, consent won't be required when um, the storage or the transmission is strictly necessary to provide um, a service to the subscriber or the user. Well, what does this mean in the context of voice assistance? Well, firstly, it means that consent under e-privacy is not going to be required when a registered user is making a request of the assistant. So when I ask my assistant to play a particular song, it's not going to need to ask for my consent to transmit that message um, out of the assistant to go and um, find that song and deliver it to me. But what happens if um, some processing is going to take place which goes beyond um, that sort of simple request? What happens if the processing is going to be um, to, you know, to learn more about my music tastes or to, or to advertise songs uh, for me to buy? Well. You know, then that comes within profiling, but that isn't um, just simply um, um, you know, actioning a request that I've made. And so then consent um, is potentially required under the e-privacy e directive. Um, and that consent is going to be attributed uh, or is going to need to be attributed to a specific user. But as we know, in the voice assistant world, um, many users could be involved. If you have a voice assistant in a house, um, you're going to have a potential whole family or, or friends who are using that device. So that can raise some very practical issues about you know, how to confirm that a particular user is using that device, and that potentially leads to the use of biometric data, um, which of course itself um, may require consent. 
Um, so these are some very interesting topics and um, not particularly addressed, I think, particularly well in the latest EDPB draft guidance. Um, so let's see if those um, are addressed um, when the guidance is finalized. And of course, consent uh, becomes relevant, not just from the e-privacy perspective, but also um, under the GDPR. So as one example, um, where data or where voice data is going to be used to identify somebody, uh, as I've said, that becomes um, biometric data, um, and therefore you're going to need an Article 9 GDPR condition. Um, so this would arise, for example, when somebody is um, asking uh, a question um, of the assistant and the assistant wants to provide a more personalized answer. So, you know, if I ask, how long is it going to take me to work, get to work today, then the device is going to need to know who is asking that question. Is it me or is it somebody else in my household? Because um, it's going to take them um, a different amount of time to get to work, depending on where they work. So lots of issues there. And finally, I'll just come on to talk about um, transparency. So as we know, a controller is required um, to provide trans uh, transparency to individuals. And this becomes um, quite difficult um, in the context of voice assistance because of the sheer number of scenarios. So where you've got um, multiple controllers, um, multiple different users and um, you know, different contexts, for example, a mobile phone with an assistant being used in a house or is it being used uh, in a car or just, or just by itself by a single user. So that becomes very difficult to explain in a, in a privacy notice, um, just because a privacy notice would get too long. And the EDPB has been um, you know, quite clear that you, know, you cannot have um, a privacy notice that's 30 pages long, um, because it would just be unreadable and therefore not satisfy transparency requirements. So what are the options? Well, um, you know, one option can be to have a separate section in the privacy notices of the actual apps which are linked to the, v, the virtual voice assistant. Um, another option is having physical aids on the device, such as screens or lights, which can provide notice about whether the device is recording or not. And the EDPB there makes it quite clear that um, you need to take account of any disabilities, uh, such as color blindness or deafness, when you're providing lights or noises which um, provide indications. And finally, another option would be um, sort of just in time notices to take into account different use cases and kind of spread that load of providing information so it's not just you know in one long document, but it, it's provided into a different chunks depending on the context. Um, so I'm going to leave it there on virtual voice assistance. Um, I think there are also some issues with data subject rights, but I will pass over to Phil. Thank you very much, Rob. I'm going to try and fast forward a slide. So at this point, I think we've, we've got time maybe just for sort of perhaps one, maybe at most two questions. Um, Leone, a question for you just initially. I know you've been looking recently into um, the implications of AI in a sort of COVID-19 era. And obviously with COVID-19, there's, there's more of a push towards contactless technology being used. And uh, increasingly, you're seeing that you, the, the sort of use of AI systems to authenticate people online, for example, you know, students who are maybe sitting online exams and using facial recognition to, to authenticate them in order to make sure that they're not cheating and having someone else at the exam. Uh, uh, opening question, is that lawful? Um, well, again, you know, you'd have to apply all of the same principles that we talked about earlier. But one of the key considerations will be, well, what's the legal basis for the processing there? And um, I, I mean, it, essentially, the likelihood is that you're going to be looking at seeking explicit consent because you, you're go because you're using biometric data there again to uniquely identify that individual, then you're going to be processing special category data. And the most appropriate condition um, that applies in that context is the use of, of explicit consent. Now, one of the key things, obviously, is that that has to involve a genuine choice. And in practice, what that's likely to mean is that you give students who don't want to um, submit to facial recognition an alternative. So that might be, for example, that you um, allow them to attend classroom 
based exams, but it's, it's important then that you don't prejudice them in any way if they decide to go for that second option. So it couldn't be, for example, that you'd they'd have to travel long distances to an exam centre in order to do the exam or that the exam, you know, the classroom based exam will be a longer exam in order to encourage them to, you know, so to submit to facial recognition. And so those considerations would be relevant in, in, in determining um, to what extent then you could rely on the, on the consent. And of course, you know, consent must meet all of the relevant as, uh, other GDPR standards as well. And then of course, there's the broader GDPR considerations around retention, et cetera, but the key one will be around the legal basis. Thank you, Leonie. I am just looking at the time and I can see that we are at the hour, so I think we may have to leave it there. Um, just for anybody who is interested in some further deep learning on AI, you can see what I did there. Um, these up on the screen here, we have links to a couple of the AI recordings that uh, our Silicon Valley colleagues have already recorded. So we've got AI in the GDPR, making sense of AI and data protection, and AI in the GDPR, establishing your lawful basis. If you want to subscribe to future updates of these or any other um, uh, any other webinars that the Phil Fisher team produces, you have our YouTube channel there. Um, other than that, it just remains for me to say thank you to me and Rob for their very comprehensive overviews of both the legal and the practical challenges when using AI. And thank you to all of you too for attending our webinar today. Um, you've got our contact details up on the screen here. If you have any further questions, please do let us know. Thank you very much.